Hey everyone, here we are starting back up with our second part of chapter one in The Hunger Games. I watch as Gale pulls out his knife and slices the bread. He could be my brother. Straight black hair, olive skin, we even have the same gray eyes, but we're not related, at least not closely. Most of the families who work the mines resemble one another this way. That's why my mother and Prim, with their light hair and blue eyes, always look out of place. They are. My mother's parents were part of the small merchant class that caters to officials, peacekeepers, and the occasional seam customer. They ran an apothecary shop in the nicer part of District 12. Since almost no one can afford doctors, apothecaries are our healers. My father got to know my mother because on his hunts he would sometimes collect medicinal herbs and sell them to her shop to be brewed into remedies. She must have really loved him to leave her home for the seam. I try to remember that when all I can see is the woman who sat by, blank and unreachable, while her children turned to skin and bones. I try to forgive her for my father's sake, but to be honest, I'm not the forgiving type. Gail spreads the bread slices with the soft goat cheese, carefully placing a basil leaf on each while I strip the bushes of their berries. We settle back in a nook on the rocks. From this place, we are invisible, but have a clear view of the valley, which is teeming with summer life greens to gather, roots to dig, fish iridescent in the sunlight. The day is glorious with a blue sky and soft breeze. The food's wonderful with the cheese seeping into the warm bread and the berries bursting in our mouths. Everything would be perfect if this really was a holiday, if all the day off meant was roaming the mountains with Gale, hunting for tonight's supper. But instead, we have to be standing in the square at two o'clock, waiting for the names to be called out. We could do it, you know, Gail says quietly. What? I ask. Leave the district. Run off. Live in the woods. You and I. We could make it, says Gail. I don't know how to respond. The idea is so preposterous. If we didn't have so many kids, he added quickly. They're not our kids, of course, but they might as well be. Gail's two little brothers and a sister, Prim, and you may as well throw in our mothers too, because how would they live without us? Who would fill those mouths that are always asking for more? With both of us hunting daily, there are still nights when game has to be swapped for lard or shoelaces or wool. Still nights when we go to bed with our stomachs growling. I never want to have kids, I say. I might, if I didn't live here, says Gail. But you do, I say, irritated. Forget it, he snaps back. The conversation feels all wrong. Leave? How could I leave Prim, who is the only person in the world I'm certain I love? And Gail is devoted to his family. We can't leave, so why bother talking about it? And even if we did, even if we did, where did this stuff about having kids come from? There's never been anything romantic between Gail and me. When we met, I was a skinny 12-year-old, and although he was only two years older, he already looked like a man. It took a long time for us to even become friends, to stop haggling over trade and begin helping each other out. Besides, if he wants kids, Gail won't have any trouble finding a wife. He's good looking. He's strong enough to handle the work in the mines, and he can hunt. You can tell by the way the girls whisper about him when he walks by in school that they want him. It makes me jealous, but not for the reason people would think. Good hunting partners are hard to find. What do you want to do? I ask. We can hunt, fish, or gather. Let's fish at the lake. We can leave our poles and gather in the woods. Get something nice for tonight, he says. Tonight. After the reaping, everyone is supposed to celebrate, and a lot of people do, out of relief that their children have been spared for another year. But at least two families will pull their shutters, lock their doors, and try to figure out how they will survive the painful weeks to come. We make out well. The predators ignore us on a day when easier, tastier prey abounds. By late morning, we have a dozen fish, a bag of greens, and best of all, a gallon of strawberries. I found the patch a few years ago, but Gail had the idea to string mesh nets around it to keep out the animals. On the way home, we swing by the hob, the black market that operates in an abandoned warehouse that once held coal. When they came up with a more efficient system that transported the coal directly from the mines to the trains, the hob gradually took over the space. Most businesses are closed by this time on reaping day, but the black market's still fairly busy. We easily trade six of the fish for good bread, the other two for salt. Greasy say, the bon bony old woman who sells bowls of hot soup from a large kettle takes half the greens off our hands in exchange for a couple of chunks of paraffin. 
We might do a tad better elsewhere, but we make an effort to keep on good terms with Greasy Say. She's the only one who can consistently be counted on to buy wild dog. We don't hunt them on purpose, but if you're attacked and you take out a dog or two, well, meat is meat. Once it's in the soup, I'll call it beef, Greasy Say says with a wink. No one in the scene would turn up their nose at a good leg of wild dog, but the peacekeepers who come to the hob can offer can afford to be a little choosier. When we finish our business at the market, we go to the back door of the mayor's house to sell, to sell half, half the strawberries, knowing he has a particular fondness for them and can afford our price. The mayor's daughter, Madge, opens the door. She's in my year at school. Being the mayor's daughter, you'd expect her to be a snob, but she's all right. She just keeps to herself, like me. Since neither of us really has a group of friends, we seem to end up together a lot at school, eating lunch, sitting next to each other at assemblies, partnering for sports activities. We rarely talk, which suits us both just fine. Today, her drab school outfit has been replaced by an expensive white dress, and her blonde hair is done up with a pink ribbon. Reaping clothes. Pretty dress, says Gail. Madge shoots him a look, trying to see if it's a genuine compliment or if he's just being ironic. It is a pretty dress, but she would never be wearing it ordinarily. She presses her lips together and then smiles. Well, if I end up going to the Capitol, I want to look nice, don't I? Now it's Gail's turn to look to be confused. Does she mean it? Or is she messing with him? I'm guessing the second. You won't be going to the Capitol, says Gail coolly. His eyes land on a small circular pin that adorns her dress. Real gold. Beautifully crafted. It could keep a family in bread for months. What can, what can you have? Five entries? I had six when I was just 12 years old. It's not her fault, I say. No, it's no one's fault. Just the way it is, says Gail. Madge's face has become closed off. She puts the money for the berries in my hand. Good luck, Katniss. You too, I say, and the door closes. We walk toward the seam in silence. I don't like that Gail took a dig at Madge, but he's right, of course. The reaping system is unfair, with the poor getting the worst of it. You become eligible for the reaping the day you turn 12. That year, your name is entered once, at 13, twice, and so on and so on until you reach the age of 18, the final year of eligibility, when your name goes into the pool seven times. That's true for every citizen in all 12 districts in the entire country of Panem. But here's the catch. Say you were poor and starving as we were, you can opt to add your name more times in exchange for a tesserae. Each tessera is worth a meager year's supply of grain and oil for one person. You may do this for each of your family members as well. So at the age of 12, I had my name entered four times, once because I had to, and three times for tesserae for grain and oil for myself, Prim, and my mother. In fact, every year I've needed to do this, and the entries are cumulative. So now at the age of 16, my name will be in the reaping 20 times. Gail, who is 18 and has been either helping or single-handedly feeding a family of five for seven years, will have his name in 42 times. You can see why someone like Madge, who has never been at risk of needing a tessera, can set him off. The chance of her name being drawn is very slim compared to those of us who live in the seam. Not impossible, but slim. And even though the rules were set up by the capital, not the districts, certainly not Madge's family, it's hard not to resent those who don't have to sign up for tesserae. Gail's know his anger at Madge is misdirected. On other days, deep in the woods, I've listened to him rant about how the tesserae are just another tool to cause misery in our district, a way to plant hatred between the starving workers of the seam and those who can generally count on supper and thereby ensure we will never trust one another. It's to the capital's advantage to have us divided among ourselves, he might say if there were no ears to hear but mine. If it wasn't reaping day, if a girl with a gold pin and no tesserae had not made what I'm sure she thought was a harmless comment. As we walk, I glance over at Gail's face, still smoldering underneath his stony expression. His rages seem pointless to me, although I never say so. It's not that I don't agree with him. I do. But what good is yelling about the Capitol in the middle of the woods? It doesn't change anything. It doesn't make things fair. It doesn't fill our stomachs. In fact, it scares off the nearby game. I let him yell, though. Better he does it in the woods than in the district.